It's episode 76 of the Author Stories Podcast. Our look back on the year 2015. I'm joined this week by my friend Chris Porto, who's co-hosting the show with me this week as we talk about things that, uh, that we loved in 2015 and things we're looking forward to in the next year. Thank you for uh, downloading the show or, or tuning into the uh, to the website, uh, finding us on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, however you found the show, also YouTube. Uh, however you found us, thank you for listening, and thank you for helping us to spread the word of the show. If you don't mind, go to iTunes, uh, leave a, uh, a rating for the show, leave a comment if you like. Also, do the same at YouTube. It really does help other people find the show. Also at HankGarner.com, there's an Amazon banner on the right-hand side. If you'll click that and then shop as you normally do, uh, you help support the podcast. Thank you for listening. On to the show with Chris Porto. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, this is the uh, the last show of the calendar year 2015, and as we did last year, I invited Chris Porto, a uh, very dear friend of mine, to come on the show and to kind of recap the year with me and to talk about what has happened and some things that we've enjoyed and uh, just kind of look back and, and then see maybe what's coming up for next year. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, 2015 has been kind of a crazy year. Uh, I remember us sitting here last year and kind of recapping what kind of what we had been through and what we'd read and, and things like that. And I, I remember at the end of the year kind of setting some goals for myself. And uh, I, I, I had a goal that I was going to write two novels and I was going to uh, – and I was going to write three short stories, mm-hmm. and I published two novels, and I published two short stories, Gosh, and, have, and have and have two more in the can that have not come out yet, but they're written. Um, <laughs> so, so I met my goals for last year, uh, but in in this year has shaped up to be nothing like I imagined it to be, um, which is. Which is kind of crazy. Um, so, so how is it different from what you imagined? Oh, I don't. I guess just the path to get there. Hmm. Um, like the, a lot of stuff happened this year that I just, you know, you, you can't foresee. And then when you look back, you say, "Well, I I, I did what I said I was going to do." Um, but if I would have, if you'd have pressed me last year uh, to tell you how it was going to happen, I would have given you a completely different path. Um, right, so, but it's one of those things because I kind of know how your year is unfolded. It's it's kind of one of those things that you can look back on when it's happening. You're like, crap, really, crap. <laughs> but then you can look back a few months later and say, you know, if if that left turn hadn't happened, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So I'm I'm actually glad it happened. Yeah, uh, and I'm a firm believer in, uh, in, in you know call it whatever. Uh, put it in whatever philosophical construct that, that you like, but uh, you know stuff is going to happen, and and no matter how much you plan and uh, and prepare for this or that, what's going to happen is going to happen, and it, I guess it's you know it's all about how you react to it and what you do with it, and and I would not have it any other way. I'm, I'm so happy uh, that things wound up the way they did, but uh, man, Excellent. what a, what a crazy year, you know? Yeah. Yeah, how's how's 2015 been for you? Um, a pretty amazing too. You know, I, I've kind of lately been wondering if I couldn't have been more productive or more this or more that. You know, but if I look back a year ago from now, um, you know, to think what I had out published then and what I have out published now, how much I've written this year uh, in my off time. You know, I do this. I do this. Uh, I have a day job, so I do this. You know, at night and in the mornings and on the weekends and that kind of thing. Um, and it's kind of a, a an amazing thing i mean i've written uh let's see i guess since about october of 2014 which is a little more than a year i guess i've written about three novels worth of stuff if you include short stories and stuff and so uh considering it took me 15 years to publish one novel um (laughs) of course a lot of that was just laying on the couch playing video games but um (laughs) three novels in a year is is pretty good for me i think Uh, so i'm pretty i'm pretty proud of that i'm pretty happy with it um um so, you know, kind of like you, twists and turns, but uh, glad to be where I am. 
so so last year, uh, the end of the year, you had uh, shadows burned in, mm-hmm. and you had B. You had the the first of the Tales of B Company. I had a couple of them. I had the first two. The and, first two. Okay, and, that's and, right. Uh, Tales from Pennsylvania uh, collection was out. Gotcha. So then you you finished out the Tales of B Company and then combined them uh, into an omnibus and and re released that. And then you had <laughs> right. Serenity Strain. Right. And uh, are you finished with the with Ironheart? The, Ironheart the, is with Ellen Campbell right now, being uh, edited. I mean, literally, I sent it to her this morning. Uh, so the second novel in the Serenity Strain novels is out is is done. Essentially, it should be out say February of 2016, something like that. Nice, nice. Have you uh, is Serenity Strain back out? Yes. Uh, okay. So the Apocalypse Weird novel that I wrote uh, is now back out under my name on Amazon. Yes. Nice, nice. Well, that's great. I, I can't wait. To, uh, I have read uh, parts of Ironheart and have loved what I've read and can't wait to to get the finished product and and see where it goes. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, but, but you also have this, uh, uh, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. You, you wish you would have been more productive here or there. Uh, and, and I too, I, I look back and I see so many things that I could have done. Maybe I could have done better. Maybe I could have, uh, you know, put more time here instead of there and that stuff. But, uh, you know, uh, you put out a pretty massive project, uh, last month that, uh, uh, that, that's got a lot of people talking. Uh, yeah, the, t- the tales, uh, tales <clears throat> of the apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, um, T-A-I-L-S. Yeah. Uh, for, for the, the three people that have no idea what Tales is, be, uh, because I've never talked about it. Um, right. Yeah. Um, just tell folks what it's about. And uh, well, it's about. basically a collection of short stories that focus on animals as protagonists. Some of the stories are actually from the animal's perspective. It's uh, descri- I describe it as The Walking Dead meets The Incredible Journey, if you remember the Disney movie. Um but uh, it's got uh, 14 authors in it, uh, and um, a lot. Half of the stories are written in in worlds that fans have loved for a long time, like uh, the Breakers world for uh, Edward W. Robertson and uh, Nick Cole's Old Man in the Wasteland world, uh, Deirdre Gould's After the Cure world. So uh, half the stories are are new and and. Um, in new worlds are all new stories, but uh, the other half are set in these fan loved worlds and, and uh, a dollar from every ish, uh, every edition sold or every uh, uh, copy sold is going to pets for vets Inc, which is a uh, national nonprofit that matches shelter dogs with um, returning veterans who have emotional uh, issues like PTSD and it saves a pet from the shelter from being euthanized and it provides a loving companion for the vet. Uh, so it, we couldn't have found a better cause to match our anthology. So that's what nice. it's all about. And yeah, it was, uh, I, I got to be part of it. I was super excited. Uh, loved reading everybody's stories. Loved. It was my, this was my first anthology to be a part of, uh, it was really eye-opening uh, to be part of the process and to kind of see how the sausage is made. Um, <laughs> it's know, bloody, man. It's, it's bloody. <laughs> it's bloody. It's um, – what did uh, – I, I know that you had uh, – you were responsible for, for putting together and curating the uh, Tales from Pennsylvania collection last year. Uh, but I, I guess this was the first one that, that you kind of solely helmed and – yeah. And it was responsible for, you know, from concept to print. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn from it that uh, uh, that maybe surprised you or uh, maybe you were happy? Uh, what Having the, the benefit of hindsight for about a, a month, a month and a half mm-hmm. now, um, what have you learned from, from putting that project so together? So what would I have done differently maybe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, and I talked with Nick Cole about this. Um, I did an awful lot of pre-launch uh, promotion for it, you know, to yeah. build buzz and all that, as they say. And I think I did that too much. I think I should have saved some of the big guns for the day of launch and after. And and we had that too, but I, I did quite a lot of, of pre-publication promotion that um, I'm not sure was as effective as it could have been uh, because – you know, a lot of it was predicated upon the pre-order thing, right? Like you can – it's out there. Go pre-order it when it's launched. It will land on your Kindle. 
And I don't think a lot of people um, care about that or or uh, value that. I think when you want to buy a book, you want it to land as, as soon as you hit, as soon as you click, you know, as soon as you hit go. Uh, and I think had we uh, repositioned some of that promotion to launch day and after, I, I think it might have been a little bit more effective. Um, so that's the that's the main thing I think I learned there. One of the things I was really surprised by. Um, because of the, the Pets for Vets link, uh, we got a lot of people that otherwise might not have ever returned a phone call um, interested in the project. There were multiple Goodreads coordinators that, that hooked us up with their readership, and there were several podcasts that I think were uh, interested in promoting the, the, the book, the collection – because we uh, were benefiting and are still benefiting Pets for Vets. So uh, I was really – it was like the Christmas season kind of thing. You know, it was uh, – people were very supportive and very uh, empathetic uh, about helping support the collection because we were benefiting uh, Pets for Vets. So I was very happy about that. Yeah. What about uh, your editor hat? You know, uh, take off the publisher hat for a mm-hmm. minute. But it's – as the editor and the the guy collecting the stories and editing them, was this a a bigger project than you anticipated? Did it did it go exactly like you thought it would, or you know did did you learn anything there as as an editor? Uh, it pretty much did what I what I anticipated. Uh, pretty much what I anticipated to happen happened. Uh, it would happen happened. And and what I mean by that is, I mean I've been an editor for about twenty years, so I know what the process is. I know you have to keep several balls in the air at the same time or, or you're not going to hit your deadline. So um, uh, I, one of the things that I did that might be a little bit different from what the writers might have experienced from another editor of a collection is that since I'm a writer, I had a lot of ideas beyond just grammar mechanics. Uh, you said it was blue over here. Now you're saying it's red. You need to make that consistent. I mean, that's what an editor does. And so I did some developmental uh, editing for all of the stories and all of the writers. And I was a little bit concerned about that because I'm like, you know, I was afraid somebody was going to say, well, who the hell are you to tell me, you know, this, <laughs> this dialogue sounds better than that dialogue. Uh, so, uh, but, but it, to a, to a person, uh, everyone was very appreciative of my suggestions. Not all of them are taken, which is of course, you know, their prerogative. Cause I'm just making suggestions as opposed to this is, this grammar is wrong or these mechanics are wrong. You need to put a comma here, that kind of thing. Um, and so I was very, very gratified that I didn't, uh, tick anybody off <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so because I, you know, I just throw it out there and if you like the idea, great. And if you don't, that's cool too. Yeah. Um, so that project took a, took a lot of the wind out of your sails. Uh, I, so to speak, I, I, I bet I'm, I would imagine kind of helming that project uh took a you know like you talked about having all the balls in the air right uh at the same time that that has to be an enormous weight on your shoulders and uh it was pretty uh, busy there for a while and and i was finishing up ironheart too so but but those kind of complemented one another because i when i when i got tired of of editing somebody else's work i'd go write a section of ironheart when i got tired of being creative, so to speak, not that editors aren't creative, but um, I could go and, and do sort of the mechanical function of editing instead. And so they, they actually complemented one another, but I did have quite a bit of, uh, I was, there was a pretty big time there between August and say October uh, where I was pretty busy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can vouch for that. I, I, uh, I remember trying to ask you a question and getting screamed at and saying, don't bother me, yeah, kid. Man, and... I'm so, I'm said, I'm sorry, man. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Oh, it was a it was a fun uh, fun project to be involved in, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It was, uh, it was oh, a lot of glad fun. to have you, man. Your story was was innovative and interesting and different than most of the other stories in the collection, which was what I was hoping for from everyone, and everyone gave me an, an iteration of that. So yours was certainly one of those. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, sometimes when you you kind of look around and 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 you see all these great people that you get to work with, and you're like, oh crap! I, I hope they don't realize that um, that I'm not as good as them, you know. And right. and I, th- I think a lot. Of, I think most writers have that fa- same kind of feeling, you know. They're like, oh wow, I, you know. Um, so it's 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 good times, fun stuff. Um, what's uh, what's the best book that you've read in 2015? Wow, that is tough. I do have a list here. I did prepare. Yeah. Um, 
Gosh, it just depends on what you're looking for. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start is, off. Go ahead. This is completely subjective. Okay. Uh, there's there's no right or wrong. And I mean, no matter what you say, I'm going to tell you that you're wrong. So yeah, right. Just, well, I'm used to that. So it's right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we're a married couple, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, what did you enjoy reading? Like, um, I, like I have a long list of, of books that I've read in 2015, and, and I've read at least one book by every guest that I've had on the show. Right. Uh, over 50 guests. So I got to compiling my list. I've well, read – What am a, I doing here? Why don't you just talk to your I, audience? I'm just – I'm saying I, I've, I've read a metric crap ton of books. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but at the end um, – you know, there, there's things, and and I enjoyed them all in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are certain things that I read that I just, you know, I just did for me. You know, and I guess that's what I'm asking. What what did you read for you that you really enjoyed this year? Okay, well, probably the number one, and this isn't gonna. Uh surprise anyone who's also read it, uh, which is pretty much everyone in the world. But anyway, Ready Player One by Ernie Klein oh, yeah. was the one I enjoyed the most um, because I am uh, of his generation, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I grew up playing, you know, going to the mall and playing video games in the arcade in the 80s. Um, and uh, all of those cultural t- touchstones that you read in the book – uh, even the, 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 uh, he had me at the beginning where he had footnotes related to D and D, you know, supposedly footnotes <laughs> yeah. related to D and D. Right. Uh, so, uh, that book really just, uh, was a joy to read. Uh, my wife enjoyed it too. Um, it's just, it was just a, a perfect representation of geek culture from the 1980s. I completely agree with you. And, uh, I don't think I've met anyone that didn't like that book. Yeah. Um, well, well, yeah, I, I don't think I've met anyone that didn't like it, uh, but that's probably because most of the people I would ask about that book are people that I know um, would have gotten the references. So, right. You know, right. that's the, the deck is probably stacked, you know, in favor. Um, so, you know, I've tried to talk Ian into reading it, my son, my 20 year old son, and um, he has not read it yet. And he's, you know, um, he's a full-time college student. You know, that's what they make duct tape for. You just need to get him in the chair. And you remember uh, Clockwork Orange? Just yes. pop open his eyes <laughs> and stick it in front. Just, are you through with that page? Okay, swipe. Are you through with that page? It, well, you know, I mean, I could, well, I could duct tape him and just put the earbuds in his ear and play the audio book. You know, that's even, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. I don't know. But so then you got to worry about keeping them awake and force feeding the coffee and all that. Anyway. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, that's uh, – so it's, it's on his list. It's on his Kindle. He just hasn't gotten to it yet. And I, uh, I – there there has to be something about all those cultural touchstones uh, that – uh, that made me want to read it. You know, when you when you start hearing the reports and hearing the reviews, you're like, oh god, I've got to read this book. You know, and I, I know you were the same way. I know yeah. you had been kind of inundated with people saying you got to read this book. Um, but you know, Ian was born in 1995, and that that whole culture had passed by then. There there were no arcades. Oh, I mean, there there are a few arcades, but they're novelty places. They're not gaming arcades anymore. You know, they're mm-hmm. places where you go play games to earn tickets now you know to Mm -hmm. to win stuffed animals uh so you know that he he missed that entire you know piece of history and and i I think when he does read i think he will enjoy it but i think they're at least half of the joke slash references that he just won't get yeah he won't get the arcade bit i don't think but you know things like joust and zork and all those you know those games are are actually coming back i mean they're you know they're on you know the, the PlayStation or whatever, and so he might actually, you know, recognize the games if he doesn't recognize the the arcade bit itself. So yeah, yeah. What, what do you think it is about nostalgia uh, that is so strong? The sto- and so nostalgic. So nostalgic that you know, that uh, I, you know there were parts of that book where I, I'm seriously like uh, you know tearing up, and uh, it it just hit this. I don't know. It, it hit this this button inside me that just uh like oh god i miss that so bad well one uh, of the things i think is that you know i remember my uh life at that time and it was pretty insular and isolated i mean you yeah. know geeks are geeks because they're, they're not social <laughs> at least that's, <laughs> that's the way it used to be uh but uh 
And so I think just hearing, you know, reading this author who obviously had these experiences, you know, plugged into these experiences and is sharing them with his readers, one of me being one of those, um, and just connecting with somebody else who had that same kind of uh, uh, insular geeky experience. Oh, so, you know, I wasn't alone in that. You know, not that, not that I didn't have other friends and, and uh, still have. I play uh, games games and all kinds of games with guys that I've been playing games with for 30 years since I was in college. So I, I you know, I understand that, but, um, uh, it was, it was neat to read somebody else who just plugged into it so well. Um, and so I think it actually, in a way sort of took me back to that time where I didn't feel now where I didn't feel so isolated, although that's the way I feel I felt at the time. I don't know if I'm making sense, but yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I do. I do. It's, um, it's this thing about you know literature and uh you know even movies and 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 songs that that just have a way of of stirring up and and I'm sure that our the the memories that it stirs up are the memories are actually better than the the actual experience was absolutely uh, yeah. you, you know I, I I don't know about you but you know I've uh you know had uh this nostalgic feeling stirred up and then you go try to recreate the thing and the thing is just not nearly as good as your memory of the thing is absolutely you know? yeah. so that's that's a great thing about books though you know it can uh it can take us to that place you know and uh without us actually having to to go through all the uh the stuff that went along with it mm-hmm. exactly so, yeah that's probably why we still love star trek and uh you know they'll they'll reboot and and rehash and Make new and there's there's still something about it that we still love, even though we gripe about all the things they do to it. We'll still go see the new Star Trek right. movie, or, right. you know. And, well, and you know, I I I do this. I'm sure you do this with your kids too. But there are these um, cultural touchstones from when you were a kid. Like one of mine is, and it's it's kind of a cheesy movie, but one of mine is the Omega Man with Charlton Heston. Oh yeah, or Cheston as I call. Yeah. It. Um, and it was just, a, it was a great movie at the time. Uh, I was like, I don't know, eight years old when it came out. Uh, and I guess I saw it on TV when I was eight or ten years old. And uh, anyway, I just, that movie scared the crap out of me. And it really influences a lot of uh, my approach to writing, just just in the, the way I uh, create my hero and, you know, usually somebody that's on their own. Um, so um, the, the guys in the um, uh, black robes with the silver eyes and all that uh and so i'm showing movies like that to to my son byron um now um because i think they're they're great movies even if they're a little bit cheesy or a little bit dated um and he usually you know he's first of all he's a good sport about watching them um but second (laughs) of all he usually i just showed him the time machine you know um from the 50s uh, a couple of weeks ago and he really enjoyed that. Um, and that now, takes – his enjoyment of it and seeing it for the first time and experiencing it, that kind of takes me back to when I did. Um, and that's part of that nostalgia you were talking about. Is he a good sport or do you just not give him a choice? No. <laughs> well, because there's, there's a lot of not giving choices at my house. That, <laughs> no, he's know. usually pretty uh, pretty good sport about, hey, Byron, let's watch this movie. I think you'll like it. Okay. You know, he's 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 not he's like, well, I'd be rather I'd rather be playing video games, but all right, dad, you know, <laughs> none of that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, did you have you gotten around to reading the uh, I, I, I don't want to say follow up because it's not a it's not a sequel to Ready Player One, but uh, Armada, his uh, Ernie Klein's second book. No, I have not read that. It's a, I did read it this year <laughs> and um, I I really enjoyed it. Uh, it is completely different from Ready Player One, and you know it uh, it it kind of got a lot of fanboy. I don't want to say hate because that's that's not the right word. Um, you know, that, a lot of people kind of got their feathers ruffled that it was not Ready Player Two. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and I thought that was really unfair. Uh, and Wesley Chu and I talked about this on the on episode 74 uh, the other day of author stories um but you know there's uh it, when your when your debut book is is as huge as ready player one was that that's a hard act to follow right and and readers uh sometimes are not very forgiving or not very um 
open-minded enough to want to follow you when you decide to go do something totally different, you know? Um, so, but I, I really enjoyed Armada and that's, uh, probably in my top 10, uh, for 2015 cool. of just, you know, uh, big summer blockbuster popcorn book, you mm-hmm. know? Um, you know, it's it, not that it had, you know, any great cultural implications or, you know, uh, it was just a, it was just a really fun book, you know, and uh, and and in a way, it kind of dipped into that same nostalgia uh, that Ready Player One did, but in a completely different way. And we, I, I won't just dissect the book because you haven't read it yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure when you do read it, you'll enjoy it. Uh, but it'll be for completely different reasons that you enjoyed Ready Player One. Well, and that's you know that's a, you can't, first of all you can't recreate lightning in a bottle. I mean, no. uh, it was, uh, Ready Player One was a great book, um, but you you probably can't. Right, Ready Player Two. I mean, because it wasn't. Uh, I'm not that he didn't have a plan for writing the book. I don't know. I haven't talked to the man, but uh, I'm sure it was a a, a well crafted uh, from the writer's side. It was obviously well crafted from the reader's side. I'm sure it was a well crafted book, but I'm sure he also didn't think, "Wow, I'm just going to blow the lid off the world with this book," you know, right? When he was writing it, so you can't. You can't create success. I mean, you can get lucky and you can have a g- great product that gets gets good press and good uh, good eyes on it and good reviews and all that. But you really can't uh, uh, pre fate uh, success. And so, uh, you know, for him to go and write a second book, first of all, to have the courage to write a second book, uh, and yeah. secondly, to go in a different direction, uh, not wanting to, not 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 trying to recreate the lighting in the bottle. I think that that speaks very well for him and, and for the book. So, yeah, well, and he used all of the references in ready player one. Uh, I don't know what else he would have used in, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like I, every page I would turn like, Oh, I remember that. I, you know, like, like there was something on every page and I, you know, there, there has to, and I have not written a book like ready player one. So this is pure speculation from my, from my point of view. Um, but uh, there, there, that has to be a uh, a balancing act of uh, you know do I cram every reference that I can remember and think of uh, and and not look like you're uh, just stuffing it with things that people are going to geek out about. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, um, like I, I have no idea what that would be like to write that book. That's uh, and 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 maybe he didn't think that at all. Maybe he just wrote it for the love of of the story and all the things that it brought up in him. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we can, we can armchair quarterback it, you know, all day long, but you know, <laughs> neither one of us wrote the book. So, right. Never mind. Um, yeah. What, what else is on your, uh, your list? Well, the, the top of my list, uh, because I just finished reading it, um, is a, a, a novel called still Alice by Lisa Genova. I believe that's how yeah. you say her last name. Um, and the reason I read the novel, uh, I'm, I'm going to be writing something this next year, and I needed to do some some homework on uh, Alzheimer's disease because that's going to figure into the book. Um, and when I was a, uh, an English graduate student in the early 90s, not not that I was in England, but I was actually studying English. Um, <laughs> as your second language. As, yeah, <laughs> clearly, yeah, I'm from Texas, so yes, English is Pink my Latin second language. Pig Latin is your first. Uh, so... I was in a history uh, graduate seminar. We were reading a book called Albion's Seed, and it was all about early English um, uh, colonization of America. And there would be a section on culture, and there would be a section on the economy, and there would be a section on this and a section on that. You know, basically the history, uh, the way that the, the, the history class would would s- slice up a description of a of a early colony in America. And then there would be a section that was fiction and uh it was basically a story that sort of summed up what was talked about in the different slices the different history slices um and the history majors in the class the graduate students in history in the class didn't like that section uh because it didn't have the demographics and it didn't have the dates and it didn't have the all the numbers that they were used to studying and i love that section being an english major um, because it did what the other slices couldn't do. It, it, it synthesized the experiences that were talked about in the different slices uh, into a story. And that's what 
drove those those chapters in Albion Seed home to me. And so that's why I picked this novel by Lisa Genova. It's a fictional, uh, uh, it's a novel, it's a fiction novel about a woman who gets Alzheimer's disease, early onset Alzheimer's at about 50 years old. Um, and I wanted to read about the experience of that from the inside out, as opposed to reading a medical journal or, or a, you know, I wanted to read the the story kind of like your author stories podcast the story behind the story right yeah. um and the novel is an incredible novel uh it's i'm i'm again like ready player one i'm late to the table i mean this novel has been um uh, it, it even at the back of the novel has uh questions that you can talk with your book clubs about i mean that's how long it's been around and how widely widely accepted it is as a, as a great novel um but uh it was so well crafted from the the uh, epigraph on uh, that I really enjoyed, as a writer, I enjoyed reading the writing. Uh, as somebody who's going to be writing about Alzheimer's disease, I enjoyed, uh, um, I appreciated the way that she approached the topic and particularly the empathy that she generates in the reader for the uh, protagonist, Alice, who uh, gets Alzheimer's disease, develops it, and the, the family experience as they deal with it. She has three children and a husband and she was a psychology professor at Harvard before this hit her. And then, you know, so it's, she, she, as she loses these different identities that we all take on, you know, mother, uh, professor, wife, um, it's very, very, very sad. Uh, but it's so well done that you, I, I would recommend anyone, uh, who knows someone who has Alzheimer's, who has someone in their family who has Alzheimer's, or any kind of uh, uh, mental illness like this that takes away identity, um, to read this novel because it's so well done um, that you'll, gra- you'll gain a great insight into the perspective of the person that's suffering from the illness. Um, so, And there's a movie uh, with Julianna Moore and uh, uh, some other, well, obviously some other folks in it, <laughs> um, no kidding, right? I just can't remember the cast. But uh, Julianne Moore plays Alice, uh, and it's uh, on my agenda for this weekend to watch, again, to sort of synthesize what I read in the book. Now I want to see how they did it in the movie and get a different perspective on it. So I recommend Still Alice by Lisa Genova. Still Alice. Uh, um, this book that you're uh, doing uh, research for, uh, is that something you're planning on writing in 2016? Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about it, but no, uh, I, I, but yes, I, uh, it's something. That it's a it's sort of a, a futuristic kind of thing, uh, and yeah. it's the, the the idea of Alzheimer's is going to have a big role in it. So nice. Well, I don't want you to say anything about it. We, but I just wanted to folks to know that they should be looking for new work from you in 2016. God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um uh, i was looking back through my list and i was trying to pick some things that are kind of quirky and uh kind of off the wall that that i might have read uh i i read a ton of sci-fi and fantasy um mm-hmm. and probably because i'm a nerd i don't know geek. you know yeah, if right, you, right. geek you know is uh is the preferred uh, usage? Yes, yes. Um, Nerds are very good at science and math. Geeks uh, love geek culture, D and D, fantasy, sci-fi. Usually, there's a, if you think of the Venn diagram, there's lots of crossover in the middle there. <laughs> right, but there is a, a subtle difference. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there is. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, my Kindle is full of sci-fi, fantasy uh, type stuff, but. I also uh, I, I love to read biographies. Mm-hmm. Uh, biographies are probably my favorite thing to read, and I especially like kind of uh, – I like to read about weird and quirky people, uh, probably because I'm weird and quirky. Um, right, right. You know, we the, always attract to those things that we are, right? <laughs> right, that's right. Uh, the uh, Walter Isaacson, Steve Jobs uh, biography. Oh, yeah is is amazing it's an amazing piece of writing uh and steve jobs was a piece of work uh man it uh like from the it, get-go or because i haven't read it so, uh, and i don't know any more than he wore you know the black turtlenecks yeah so was, so like uh, the get-go or did he just kind of go like uh um he just kind no, of developed I, that or what no i think he was just kind of always a jerk um <laughs> he <laughs> and and <laughs> 
And I say that with the utmost respect. Absolutely. I, I heard it coming through. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, and that, and, and, and one reason I say that is because, uh, he was, he was involved with this book. Uh, he, I don't know that he was exactly on board from the beginning, but I think uh, Isaacson kind of brought him on board. And you know, by the time it was over, uh, Jobs gave him access, or, or at least you know, uh, implied permission. Uh, you know, whether he needed it or not, but gave his blessing. Uh, let me put it that way: uh, to talk to people from his past, good and bad. Uh, relationship status wise you know mm-hmm. um, like encouraged him to reach out and get the the negative side of the story as well as the positive which um, which is pretty crazy uh, I I don't know that I would do that for a biographer um, you know there's there are certain things I'd rather just leave well, then, where, then where they lie don't have them get in touch with me <laughs> exactly that's that's why I take <laughs> the initiative to have you see that this way I can I can, you know, I I I have control of the spin. Right? Who's you know? who's editing this podcast? Exactly. That's right. Exactly. See, nobody's going to know that we recorded for three hours and I only put out forty three minutes. I know. See? I quit screaming That's... a long time ago, and I'm sure it's not even still in. Is it? You t- took it right out. Hello, hello. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, you're coming in stupid again. Um, again. You just can't yes. leave that line alone. I'm always looking for a place to land it. It just, you know, it's it's always just circling around, hovering, just looking for a place to land. Anyway, um, yeah, it was uh, it, it was one of those books that's that's really fascinating because you you air quotes know this person or you you know about this person, you know their public persona, mm-hmm. um, and then you start uh, and and you know that they have this quirky persona already, you know, and you, you've heard stories and this, and then you start kind of peeling the layers back and you realize that some of those stories you heard are absolutely as bad as you heard they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the stories you heard were just taken out of context and some of the stories you heard were not nearly as bad as they actually were. Um, and that's on one hand, that's a, a very enlightening, uh, you know, to, to kind of see that, uh, t- to put some humanity mm-hmm. on this on the story of a person, uh, and it's also really uncomfortable to read in some points because it's almost like you shouldn't be there reading this. It's a little bit too it, private for your it, eyes. Yeah, like like you just feel like uh, I don't know. I I uh, I, I guess I, I have a tendency to kind of. Um, uh, try to humanize the the story and and it just it just felt very violating to me in in some places you hmm. know and and you know and that's just that's me projecting so, so sort of a, a car wreck on the side of the road kind of yeah thing. yeah you know yeah, you can't look away like, but you're you feel bad about looking at it exactly that's exactly what it is it's like oh man i shouldn't be seeing this but oh god i can't stop watching it you know and um yeah it's just crazy so um uh, but it's really, really, really good book. Uh, very eye-opening, very enlightening. Uh, you start uh, seeing some of the thinking behind the technology that we all carry around with us. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's really fascinating. It's uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, so yeah. Well, I had a, uh, I had a book like that myself, uh, and it was a biography, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. It's called John, and it was by Cynthia Lennon. Um, oh, so it was a biography of from, of her from time. John Lennon's first wife. Yes, it was it was a biography of her time with with John Lennon. Uh, came out, I don't know. She died. Uh, Cynthia Lennon died, I think, in the last year, year and a half or so. Yeah, uh, and it came out a little bit before that, uh, a few years ago, I think. Um, and I found it to be um, a, a very well balanced and enlightening book. I mean, I kind of couldn't put it down. I'm a, I'm a Beatles freak, so. Um, yeah from a long time ago. Um, so Aren't when I, all. when I start, well, you and I are have to, at least of, of our age group. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so you'd probably have to duct tape Ian down to get him to listen, but no, he's a, he's a beetle. Oh, I'll see. Okay. All is not lost. Ready player yeah. one is, has got to happen sometime soon. Oh yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, it was, it, it, I don't know how much you know about Lennon, John Lennon, but, um, I kind of saw, 
Let me back up a little bit. I'm trying to, I'm dancing around a little bit because there was some behavior in that book, like uh, uh, how she found out that he was with Yoko and and his treatment of Julian Lennon as a as a young boy, that are not very nice. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't I didn't see her as grinding an axe at all. I saw her as just sort of like telling this is what happened, and and she. Uh, she presented herself and her story as a very uh, a balanced approach to her, the experience with John, um, and I, I just found it a fascinating read. Um, and I, I'm, I believe that you know people that reach that level of of artistic success, writer, you know, artist, uh, musician, whatever it might be, or or you could even say president of the United States or whatever, um, they're just not normal. You know, yeah, uh, and, and that's what makes them, if quote unquote, great. I mean, that the the artistic chances they take. You know, Faulkner was a drunk, um, but he was an incredible writer. Um, and so, some of the chances that they take, I think, derive from the same personality that that can create pain in their own personal life. And and Lennon did that, um, where Cynthia and Julian were concerned. So. Um, love his music. Still, still think he's a great guy uh, as ter- in terms of a uh, of a person that ch- that achieved greatness. And um, I think personally, he had some wonderful values that I'd like to emulate. Um, but he wasn't perfect, and you see that in this biography. Well, that's uh, that's a bit of the way the uh, the Jobs biography was. Uh, you know, you you did get to see. Um, you know the uh the emotional growth and uh and you got to see the uh the pain and the brokenness that happened because of relationships that were not handled correctly mm-hmm. um but you, you know you did get to see some resolution to that and and he was very deft in his uh portrayal of uh Steve's Mr. Jobs uh, emotional growth, and, and I think that that is important when you're telling a story as heavy as that. Uh, is that you, um, you know, that, that you uh, it, at least try to to cover it and 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 treat them with uh, with as much humanity as as they deserve. Right, and that's that's the thing. You know, you read these biographies of these icons, um, and and what it what they do is. I mean, you've got this very uh, black and white image of the icon. I mean, almost by definition, right? Right. Um, and then you read, oh, these subtleties about their character that could be good, could be bad, whatever. Uh, but you, re- but you're right. It humanizes them, and and we all know from living every day that humans aren't perfect, and uh, you know there are a lot more grays than black and white. Um, so yeah, that that's that's what books like that do. Yeah, and and you. You hope that uh, when people look at your life, uh, that they look in all the windows and not just the kitchen window. Uh, yeah, you don't want to look at my know. kitchen window. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> yeah, I've heard stories. Um, See a margarita yeah. machine, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a margarita machine. Oh. I, I I get a little jealous sometimes when I see your your post. Oh of, man. Uh, Next time we get know, together, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's 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 going to happen. Um, on while I'm on uh, biographies, and this is a, a kind of off the wall. It's probably not a biography. It's probably more of a memoir, um, it, or it may just be a goofy book. Uh, I don't know how you classify it, but um, uh, Kevin Smith's book called Tough S H uh, Asterisk T. That, that's the title. Tough of shot. I, he was a he was a hockey player. He was a, he was a hockey. Tough well, shot. He was, huh. Yeah, tough shot. That that's the that's the actual title of the book. I think the the missing vowel is there for you to supply <laughs> as you see fit. Suddenly, we're playing Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> uh, there's a subtitle to the book though, and I'm pulling it up right now. Um, My life mm-hmm. in the hockey league. Well, it, it's uh. It's not that Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith, the uh, the film director. Um, <laughs> life advice from a fat, lazy slob who did good. Um, now I got to retitle my book for next. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> God, curses foiled again. Um, this book, if you you know, if you were someone of our generation, and and I think uh, Kevin probably appeals to 
I think his core audience is probably a people of a few years younger than us. Not many. Not many. But yeah. Not many. Um, you know, he is our age, or he's he's one year older than me. I think a couple of years younger than you. Um, so you know, in that range. But you know, he he kind of uh, he made this movie Clerks in the early nineties, right. uh, and kind of was one of the defining voices of the slacker, you know, uh, generation. Um, but you know, he, he has gone on to build this entire media empire around podcasting and, uh, writing and making these quirky, weird movies and, you know, just all, all this kind of stuff that he, he is, uh, has, you know, become a very wealthy man, uh, doing stuff that's that's not exactly in the mainstream. You know, he he definitely has a uh, a big audience and a, a rabid of audience that that buys and supports all that he does, but he's not necessarily a mainstream figure. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he's kind of taken this love of geeky stuff and and kind of you know quirky uh, kind of this slacker lifestyle and and turned it into a you know, a niche, um, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And, and this book is all about how he kind of did that and kind of parlayed his, you know, love of star Wars and comic books and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, off color jokes into, you know, a, a pretty good life. So it's like how to be a couch potato and get paid for it. That should have been (laughs) kind of, kind of, but you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an oddly very motivational book. Um, you know, because and, and he's it's very self deprecating. So, you know, if you uh you know, if you're into that kind of humor, uh, you know, to begin with, it's it's very entertaining. Um but by the end of the book you're like, Oh my god, if this guy could do it, anybody can <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm sure Kevin Smith listening to this yes. really appreciates the sentiment. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin, please return my email. Um <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna so, have it now. <laughs> right. So uh you know, it's it's one of those things that's and, and it's very tongue in cheek. Um, you know, and he's making fun of himself and he's very aware that he's making fun of himself. It's it's not one of these you know, it's not like who was that guy that was on one of the early uh years of American Idol uh Oh, dude, you uh, got and, me. Uh, anyway, he was he he did this horrible audition uh but he thought he was really good and uh and he wound up uh recording a couple of albums william hung was that his name i don't know i'm not sure anyway, so man cuz I, I, I just <laughs> the best porn name i've heard in a long time I know. but the you know and and i don't know how aware this guy was of what was going on but the the impression was uh that that the joke was on him and that everybody knew the joke but him uh, mm. but the, the funny thing was he went on to sell like a couple million records. And so at the end of the day, you know, the joke was on everybody else. But anyway, what, what I'm getting to is this is not that book. It's, uh, it's very self deprecating, very self effacing, um, but very intentionally so. Um, you know, and, um, and it was just, a, it was a fascinating read to me. It was, uh, uh, there's a lot of geek culture stuff in there. There's a lot of things that uh, resonate with, uh, uh, you know, with with people of our generation, mm-hmm. uh, and also a kind of a spin on a kind of this indie uh, ethic that you know uh, you don't need, uh, you know, in his case, the big movie studios. Uh, you don't need the big publishers. You don't need this whole thing that we grew up thinking that we needed uh to to be successful and to get your art out there it's it's really in your hands and if you don't make it it's nobody's fault but your well, own well that's you, you know, know you, when i when i became an indie publisher when i published my first novel that that's pretty much what i told myself i was like you know for 20 years i've tried to get an agent well i had agents but they didn't really do anything for me i tried to get a publisher nobody's interested but now with with amazon and being able to self publish and all that if i don't put something out there and see what happens to it it's nobody's fault but mine right that's all right that's right and that that's definitely the 
uh, the vibe that you get from the book. It's you know it, it's very funny, it's very humorous. There's lots of uh, inside stories of you know things that happened along his career and people he ran into, and uh, you know he throws names out there and it's very uh, funny stories. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a very motivate, motivating story uh-huh. uh, of of kind of taking this this indie work ethic and and making something uh, that for um, for you know as as long as there's been publishing, you know there there's been this wall and you know and there there are these these keep these gatekeepers and and they you know tell you whether you can or cannot and and those days are over and you definitely get that kind of uh, that hyped up feeling at the end, like, man, I can do this. You know, if, if, if good Lord, if this guy can do it, I, I can. Man, there's it, so much you know? crossover with him. You should definitely have him on the show. I know. I, Kevin Smith returned my email. Okay. Anyway. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that, I would add that to, uh, you know, it's, it's my, my quirky off the wall pick, but, uh, I would definitely recommend that book. I, I, uh, I think, um, that everybody would get something out of it. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, uh, anyway, do you, do you have another one? Yeah, um, one that I think I think you've read, uh, "The End of the World as We Knew It" by Nick Cole. Yeah, Tio Twaki. Tio Twaki. That's right. I just love saying it. It sounds like something you should be ordering in a restaurant. I'll, I'll have the Tio Twaki, please, and with some yep. egg drop soup. With please, I, and uh, with the uh, orange sauce. Yes, uh, it's always better with the orange sauce. Tio Twaki orange right. is what I call That's it. That's right. It's great. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, right. anyway, um, so the reason I wanted to talk about this novel um, is it's basically a novel of the zombie apocalypse. If you want to put it into a genre, but it was so um, innovative in its approach. Um, First of all, Nick Cole is the best indie writer on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he just he was one of three writers that showed me, oh, you can self-publish and not suck. Oh, great. Wow, I didn't realize that. Okay, sure, I'll try this. Uh, and his Old Man in the Wasteland novel was, was the one that hooked me and then the ones after that. But anyway, so Tio... He's a heck of a nice guy. Too. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a really sweet guy and he's very supportive of other indie authors and we're, we're all, we're both buddies with him now and, which yeah. still blows my mind, by the way. Yeah. I still, I play D&D with Nick Cole. Wow, that's <laughs> amazing. Um, but anyway, um, so the end of the world as we knew it, uh, is the story of, Basically, uh, two lovers um, who are separated uh, during uh, the apocalypse, and you get the story in various uh, uh, ways. You get it from uh, a dictated um, um, a journal. You get it from a written journal. You get it from after-action reports by the authorities that are still around after the zombie apocalypse happens. Um, and so the narrative itself, you know, as the world is fractured and and cut off and the zombies are overrunning everything uh the narrative itself reflects what's happening in the story because the narrative is told in fra- in a fractured way you get the story in bits and parts um and i really appreciate the craftsmanship that goes into that where you you unify the way you approach the story with the thematics that are happening in the story itself that's that's a real expression of of art the way art is made. And so I really appreciated that as a fellow writer, uh, the way Nick approached the book. And besides that, it's just a really great story, um, sort of a heartbreaking story. I don't want to give too much away, but but um, it's it was just a really innovative approach to the zombie apocalypse. Um, you know, uh, the, the typical, the, the end of the world happens and then humanity gets cordoned off and then you have the dynamics between people as they're trying to survive and all that kind of thing. That was there too. But the overarching story about these separated lovers and and uh, I, th- I just thought it was really well done. Absolutely, and that's uh, that's on my top uh, reads for the year as well. Um, and uh, and you kind of touched on this a little bit uh, when you were talking about tales earlier and um, and talking to Nick about that. The, one of the cool things about uh, the end of the world as we knew it is. Uh, that he just brought it out of nowhere. Nobody was expecting mm-hmm. it. And one day, well, he, he kind of teased it up for a few days, but it was just a few days, and then all of a sudden, bam! There's this new book, and uh, 
and yeah, that I was like, man, I I, uh, I wish I could sneak things this good out uh, to people. You know, I mean, it's just out. I, I was like blown away. Well, and you know, he, we yeah, he and I actually talked about this about a week and a half ago. About you know, it's really hard as a writer when you got something that you think is good. Not to start talking about it. Not not in mm-hmm. a crowing kind of way. Not in a this is the be- this is the great American novel. Please read this, and then you'll never read anything else because I'm so great. Not that way at all. That's not what I mean. Just y- you've crafted something, you're proud of it, and you want to start talking about it, and you want to show the cover, and you want to throw s- snippets out there on Facebook, and and he didn't do any of that, uh, and that takes a lot of self discipline. Yeah. It does, and uh, and and like you said, it's not from crowing. It's just that, uh, you know, this is what we do. We 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 put words together that we hope, um, you know, hit people between the eyes or, mm-hmm. or, or in the heart, or you know, and and when you and everybody knows when when you write something that uh, that's really good, um, you just know it, you know, and you just you want people to to read your words because that's. It's what we do. That's why we do it. And yeah, so uh, anyway, yes, uh, that's definitely uh, on my top of the year as well. Cool. What's another one? Uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to kind of whittle down my list here as we talk. Um, one thing that I've really enjoyed there there are uh, a bunch of books that I read this year that I that I really really liked. Uh, Flicker, the Flicker Men by Ted Kosmatka, uh, is excellent, excellent book, and one that kept me awake several nights. Uh, and if you've read it, you'll know what I'm talking I, about. I have it's it, so the, tell me, tell me about the book. Uh, well, it's uh, it's kind of a a uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, it, it's kind of a um. I'm I'm I'm, tr- <laughs> I'm trying to, to to figure out a way to to summarize so, this. So book sci-fi for you. is it sci-fi? It, it is it is sci-fi, but it's uh it's kind of the the moral and philosophical implications. It, it's a it, it's kind of unraveling what it what some of the implications of quantum mechanics are. Okay, and on on real people and in, in real world situations. So you've got uh and kind of what uh if, if they're if these theories hold up, and um, and, uh, and and we're talking about uh, you know the the possibility of multiple dimensions, we're talking about the ability or the the way that uh, that matter behaves, and uh, and uh, I, I know I'm sounding stupid, but um, it's see I, I'm avoiding I'm not saying you're coming in stupid. I know I know. <laughs> And, and you you have every right to so I'm just going to go ahead and, and put that out there for you. Um, so it, if these things hold true, what does that mean for fate? What does that mean for free will? What does that mean for uh, you know the uh, your station in life and what control you have? Over your own destiny. Okay, so it's kind of a, a sci-fi quantum mechanics version of, of uh, the kind of determinism that we saw maybe ten or fifteen years ago with like uh, uh, cellular research and, and using you know um, cells for you yeah. know that kind of thing. It's like, well, are we determined by our DNA or do we? You know, am I just going to get Alzheimer's when I'm sixty-two because my mom did or whatever? You know, those kinds of questions. So it's it's kind of like that, only related to spatial. Anonymous yes, and 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 how humans play into this, and so do are, are what makes what makes humans human? Uh, is there such a thing as a soul, and what is it that embodies us that makes us different from everything else? Mm-hmm. And um, and what happens if some people are not born with that? Uh, and you know, then you start kind of unraveling the implications of uh, what makes people commit heinous crimes, and uh, are the so my dimension it, made me do it exactly. And then, uh, well, do you, you know are these people different? Did they come from another place? Did they are they you know, anyway? I, I'm giving away too much and not giving away anything at all at the same time. Uh, it's a fascinating book. It, it is a complete page turner. Um, Ted is a fantastic writer, 
and the the story he uh, he weaved is incredibly compelling. Uh, will definitely make you think. Uh, but it's a it's a great uh, you know action adventure mystery. Uh, all the while he's dropping these nuggets that just completely screw with your brain. Oh, very cool. Uh, so yeah, it's a great book. I highly recommend very it. Very cool. Um, so yeah, the uh, the Flicker Men by Ted Kazmatka is. Uh, uh, and and Ted has about three other novels I think that I have on my Kindle, and I just haven't gotten to them yet. But uh, yeah, he's he's a I uh, so happy to have connected with him this year uh, because he's a fantastic writer, and uh, you should definitely look for stuff by cool. him. Cool, cool, will do. Yeah, so so that's one of my uh, my top books of the year. Uh, I got one more that I'll talk about. Okay, um, and that's Weapons of Mass Deception by David Bruns. David's a, a friend mm-hmm. of ours. Uh, oh, he's a yeah. Navy veteran. He was in. He's got a story in Tales as well. Um, and the the premise of the book is, if you know uh, anything about the Gulf War, um, well, if you know something about the Gulf War specifically, that is that uh, Iraq sent their air force over to Iran for safekeeping, and Iran said, "Thank you." <laughs> right. Well, he takes that premise and applies it to uh, weapons of mass destruction, and basically his his fictional premise is that Saddam sent all his weapons of mass destruction to Iran for quote unquote safekeeping, and that's why we didn't find them. And Iran said, "Thank you." Uh, and so his weapons of mass deception is about um, Iranian um, uh, terrorists deciding to use these weapons. Uh, and in a, in a terroristic way, you know, given our, our current climate and circumstances. Um, and it's a very, very well done uh, suspense political thriller type uh, book. I mean, the, when I was reading it, the first thing I thought of was Tom Clancy, who was a, a hero of David's, actually. And uh, you can tell because it's, it's just so well done and such a page turner. Um, that uh, it was it was just a thrill to read. It was a lot of fun. Dave is a great writer anyway, but the story itself, he really he and his co-author, uh, Mr. Olson, uh, was did J R J R Olson. That's right. Uh, did a great job with the story. And so anyway, if you like political thrillers and you know the the current culture and, and climate of international intrigue that's going on with terrorism and all that, if that fascinates you or interests you, I do recommend it. I, I got that same um, Clancy esque feeling when I read it. Um, it. It felt like early Clancy uh, to me in that um, kind of like Hunt for Red October. Exactly. Um, you know his uh, Clancy's later books before he passed away uh, uh, in, in an untimely uh, manner. Um, you know, but some of his his later books, you know, you would be 150 pages in, and he's still introducing characters. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's just so much to juggle. You know, some of his earlier works felt more immediate, uh, more succinct, uh, very. Uh, you know, not that uh, not that his his later stuff. You know, was, weren't good stories. They absolutely were, but uh, David has a has a real way of. Uh, you know, getting down to the uh, to the core of the story and making you immediately uh, care about what's going right. on. Right, and one of the things uh, I found you know. interesting about the novel was that you ba- it's basically a fifty fifty novel between the good guys and the bad guys. Yeah, uh, you know, he does a great job of getting inside you know the head of the the terrorists, and you're you're. I would. I don't want to say you're empathizing with the terrorists at all. I don't mean that, but but you but you understand. Yeah, they're human characters. They're not just right. two dimensional archetypes looking to blow stuff up. Yeah. Uh, and so I thought he did a really good job um, balancing the story between the two sides, the good and the bad. Uh, and and it's really like you said, it's it's very much like Hunt for Rod October is basically a chase movie with submarines. And right. he does that uh, with he and he and uh, Gerald do that. With his story as well, and it's it's worldwide. Some in Iran, some in Iraq, some in the, uh, the United States, uh, and because he is a Navy veteran, and and Mr. Olson, uh, I believe, was a liaison to the CIA or something like that, they bring uh, some some real world experiences into the writing process, and so they didn't do, they didn't have to. I'm guessing I haven't talked to him about this, but I'm guessing they didn't have to do a lot of research. Uh, because yeah. they lived it, and so then they take that and turn it into great fiction, and it's just it's just a great read. Yeah, I, I 
completely agree with you. And uh, and I have a hardcover uh, of that book on my shelf right behind I me. Do and, I uh, do too. I got that special for supporting the. the yeah, the it's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, man, what a gorgeous hardcover! Yeah, it is. Uh, on top of being a, a fantastically written book, man, just the every every detail of the entire project is is just uh, top notch and quality and uh, just really fantastic. I mean, it's really proud to have it on my shelf. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm trying to think of. Uh, I'm going to hit a couple of things kind of quickly okay. that I've enjoyed this year. Um, uh, you uh, turned me on to Bernard Cornwell. Oh, yeah. Uh, who who I was very excited to have on the podcast. And he was uh, who to listen to. That was a great oh, podcast, man. by the way. Yeah, he's he's such a such an awesome guy. Uh, so I started reading his uh, King Arthur trilogy yeah. um, at the end of the second book. Man, just... Loving it, loving it. Um, he is just a great wordsmith. He is a man, great craftsman. He is, and and I loved listening to him talk. I I love hearing people talk craft <laughs> anyway because you know everybody has their own you know nuances and their own little quirky you know things that they do, and I I'm I'm fascinated by that. I'm I'm fascinated by where stories come from. You know that, that's one reason I do this podcast is I just I just love to hear people talk about it. I, I, there's this kind of you know mythical quality to storytelling that it. You know, it never gets old to me. I just love hearing where, you know, these crazy things come out of people's heads. Uh, and I, his was no, uh, no exception. Uh, and I loved hearing him talk about, uh, you know, kind of his process. And, uh, you know, and he has some very uh, uh, strong opinions about uh Outlining versus you know pantsing, <laughs> right, <and> right. <laughs> that I was very surprised to hear. You know that that uh, I was very surprised to hear that he's not that much of a plotter. Yeah, me too. Um, because because it's all of his stuff is so historical based. You know, and, I know. But and apparently, it, and he the, just knows it all. And they're so tight. You yeah. know, uh, you know, you can. Um, you know, there, there's some of Stephen King's books. You know, you get 800 pages in, and you're like, "This story's running out of gas." You know, and um, and and I'm not. Uh, that is not a dig at Stephen King, at not whatsoever, because uh, he's Stephen King, and I'm not. <laughs> um, but you know, there, there's just some stories you can just tell that you know. Well, I don't know where this story's going, and apparently he didn't either. Um, yeah. You know, but but Cornwell's is absolutely not that way. I mean, it's so intricate and um yeah and i don't know if you've hit yeah. one or not and you probably have given the arthurian uh series but when he describes uh attacking a shield wall um and you know how the how the short swords come up under the shields to try to break through the shield wall of the of the the enemy and uh, he there nobody writes a battle scene yeah, like, right. like cornwell does yeah it's cinematic yeah yeah very uh yeah, very elaborate, very very visual, very uh, visceral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is a is a good word. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so uh, thank you for uh, introducing me to him, and uh, uh, that was only like uh, fifty two or fifty three more novels to go, and you'll be caught up. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, another interview that I did uh, this year that uh, was very eye opening was uh, Craig Johnson, the author of the Walt Longmire mystery series. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, what a great uh, interview that was. Uh, he was I, I still say that was one of my favorite interviews to do. Um, and and I'm, I, I've am i started reading the, the Longmire novels, and if you're a fan of the TV show, um, the novels are even better. <laughs> They're just, man, he's such a great writer. Um, and I, I think I have the benefit of... of Having watched a couple of seasons of the TV show, uh, because I, I kind of have these characters in mind. Um, I know some people don't agree with that and, and don't like that, but um, I don't know. He's he's a very visual uh, storyteller, and and the books are funny. Uh, it's something you don't get a lot from the TV show. Uh, there's a lot of humor in there and a lot of uh, 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 very rich characters. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm loving his series, and um, uh, that's something new I picked up this year. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So I highly recommend the Walt Longmire mystery series. Um, let's see. Uh, Jim Butcher was on the show this mm-hmm. year. And uh, Jim's new uh, steampunk series, the Aeronauts Windlass, uh, is, is really good. Uh, if you're into steampunk or that uh, steampunk kind of meets um, uh, Horatio Hornblower. Oh, very you know, cool. So if you kind of, like- yeah, yeah. So you, it's kind of like swashbuckling, you know, steampunk, um, which was not something I expected from Jim Butcher. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Dresden Files. Uh, love, love, love that series of books, but it's not something I expected, but is really, really awesome. Um. Yeah, so uh, another thing we didn't touch on, uh, The Martian. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, th- I think I actually read the – no, I read The Martian this year. Yeah, it was this year. Uh, and then uh, saw the movie, which uh, was exciting and fascinating. And, um, yeah, probably one of the best movies I've seen this mm-hmm. year. Uh, really? A, a little different from the book uh, in, in some places. In other places uh, – uh, spot on. I, I think the tone was spot on, uh, and uh, yeah, I was super excited about that. So, uh, highly recommend The Martian. Well, and one thing I want to point out, um, I think uh, it's because we're talking sort of going into the visual media thing now, just briefly. Yeah, uh, is the idea of um, what Netflix is doing with uh, some of the Marvel comic characters, and CBS yeah. has done with Supergirl. I'm really gl- okay. It's it's the 12 year old comic book geek in me i understand this but this concept that was the case a few years ago like with heroes where okay we can't show super powered people wearing tights anymore it's just so yesterday we can't do that we have to have normal people flying around and lifting buildings and stuff and which i never liked i thought it was silly but to yeah. see the resurgence of comic book costumed characters in the Avengers and Supergirl and, and the Batman Superman Dawn of Justice that's coming out in March and it it really it's that nostalgic thing again but they're doing it pretty well um, just straight up geek yeah exactly uh, just no unashamedly apologies. caped uh, characters yes uh, yes and I'm, I'm glad preach, to see brother that. preach yeah I'm glad to see yeah. that yeah I, I'm loving Supergirl by the Good, way. yeah, um, I'm you, glad. Yeah, I, I love I, it too. I think it's a great uh, one of the things that I try to do with with Byron, uh, my son. He's 13 now. Um, is show him positive representations of female protagonists, um, and I think that's a great show that does that. Um, you know, we've watched Buffy and and uh, other shows, and and I introduce him, and my wife introduces him to books. Um, not as a way of, of, you know, trying to brainwash him in any way, but I want, cause he's going to get enough of not oh, positive yeah. portrayals of female oh, protagonists yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. So I'm trying to balance that out a little bit. And I, I just talking about, there, there's a whole industry built on not positive yes, portrayals. Yes, unfortunately, of... yes. <laughs> uh, right. But I think Supergirl does a great job of, of because I, pretty much every major character in that show is, is, uh, is female. Um, her boss and her her major nemesis, and so uh, I think that's. I, a good, I love thing. her boss played by Callista oh, Flockhart. Yeah, I've Callista um, Flockhart since Ally McBeal. She's just a oh, wonderful actress. And and there's a uh, there's a uh, there's an almost tongue in cheek quality uh, to some of the ways they handle feminism mm-hmm. and and this uh, this idea of strong female protagonist uh, and it's like they they know the arguments that they're going to get uh and they go ahead and and kind of poke fun at themselves sometimes yeah. uh which one lightens up the whole situation and allows them to sh- to say you know what we can have um we can have a strong female that's also uh tender and uh a little uh altruistic uh and we can also have a strong female that is, uh, you know, more uh, overt and vocal, uh, you know, and both of these things are valid. Right. And, and that we don't diminish one for the other. Right. And I love, I love, you know, I have three daughters. And so I, I'm like you, I'm always looking for, um, uh, for those kind of examples. And, and I'm always looking for things that I can enjoy with them. 
you know, and and there's sadly not a lot of that out there. Uh, but I I love the way that they kind of anticipate some of that and go ahead and handle it themselves. And it's just a lot of fun. I, I think they, you know, um, take a very serious thing and uh, treat it seriously, but uh, also not. Yeah, so they're serious not. They don't the let themselves. Time. I mean, the title of the show, Supergirl. They don't. That was within the yeah. first episode, right? And and I think shouldn't it be Superwoman? And 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 they had this whole debate. I'm a girl. I'm your boss. I'm a media mogul. I'm a girl. I'm happy with it. You know. So basically, right, exactly. the, the point is, don't label me with with whatever your political agenda is, left, right, middle, doesn't matter. Uh, why don't you judge me on who I am and what I do? Uh, yeah. Which is you know perfect, right? Yeah, and and they do it without being preachy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, I, I said all that to say they do it without Absolutely. being preachy. Yeah, I mean it's it's so it's so much fun and so well done um, that anyway I, I highly recommend that show. If we're yeah, about- you know, uh, Flash is all also doing that very well. You know, uh, they they built this this pure geek comic book show, and it is an unabashed comic book mm-hmm. show. Uh, and but they built this whole team around the Flash, and uh, he has uh, several strong women, and uh, it's a it's a very well done, well balanced show that uh, that I'm loving right now. So, yeah, unfortunately, my DVR missed the first six episodes of Flash and Arrow this year, so I'm going to have to go back and pick them up. Shut. I know up. I'm way behind, but uh, oh, we got to fix. Uh, yeah, that. oh, it's fixed now, nice. but yeah. I, I'm waiting on them to catch up. So. Yeah, Hulu. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just one word, <laughs> Hulu. <laughs> yeah, we, I can tell you how to fix that. Um, yeah, so so that's good. And uh, I have not watched Jessica Jones yet. I, uh, I, it's okay. It's very if you like Daredevil, uh, and you wouldn't mind it going about a degree and a half grittier, grittier. Uh, I think you'll like Jessica Jones, uh, and I, I like it in the same way I like Supergirl. Although Supergirl is much more prime, you know, ready for prime time. Um, Jessica Jones is much grittier, but uh, if you if you re- if you watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you remember Faith from that show, if Faith grew up and became a private eye. Uh, she would be Jessica Jones. Almost literally, her attitude, uh, her approach to life, her her way of dealing with people, even her look. The, I, I forget the actress that plays Jessica Jones. I'm sorry, but but even the the dark hair and just the the sort of kick ass look that she carries around with her. I mean, it could be Faith grown up from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So, and I really like that character of Faith because it was so she was so complex. Which is what I love about characterization. Don't give me black hats and white hats. Just you know, g- give me complex because that's what humans are all about, right? And uh, Jessica Jones is very much that. It's very much grittier. It's it's an adult program. I would not recommend it for teenage kids below about sixteen, maybe even eighteen. I would call it R rated plus. Um, but having said that, uh, I think it's a great show. In fact, I wa- I binge watched it twice. I watched it once uh, over. I don't know. Four weeks ago or so, and then I was like, uh, "Allison, you got to watch this with me." So I watched it again with my wife, and she agreed. It's a great show. And and it's based on uh, wasn't it based on the the Marvel comics run called Alias? Uh, I'm... maybe. I, I I know the character is, is a Marvel comics character, and, and in the comic right. book, she was a part of the Avengers for a while, and um, all that part of the and part of the Defenders. Yeah, just yeah, um, yeah, cool. Um, so, um, I, uh, the episode I recorded the other day will come out before this one airs, so, um, you're in a time machine. Uh, <laughs> episode 75, which comes out, uh, the one before this one when you're listening to it, uh, but comes out Monday if you're listening in real time, which only Chris and I are, so the... <laughs> <laughs> is 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 with Gene Yang, uh, who is the writer of Superman. Ooh, cool! And, the comic, uh, the comic, yes, the Superman comic. Right now, I had you know, and for a geek kid who uh, you know um, has loved Superman and the Justice League since you know I was six years old. Man, that was uh, that was a dream come true. Not bad. Uh, Very yeah, cool. And. Uh, and it's episode seventy five, and this is Superman's seventy fifth birthday. Oh, look at that! Uh, I, and I did not plan that, but wow. uh, it was kind of cool fate. the way it worked. 
that's that multi-dimension paint. folding in on itself there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, and uh, Scott Snyder, who is the writer of Batman uh, right now, who is just crushing it at DC, uh, has been for four years writing Batman, mm-hmm. uh, is coming on the show in a couple oh, of weeks. cool. Uh, so man, super stoked about that. And um, which you know, it's a it's a good which kind of this 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 whole talk has kind of come full circle. Um, it's a good time to be a geek right now. It is. You know, there's there's so much. Uh, I, I remember as a kid, and I know you do too. Um, you know, I loved comic books, and and part of that came from you know growing up as as a kid with dyslexia and having a really hard time in school and. Uh, th- there was something about comic books, and there's a you know it's a, of course it's a mixture of the visual uh, art with uh, uh, with text that you know is easier for a dyslexic brain to process. Uh, I think the 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 colors and the pictures distract the brain and help it settle mm-hmm. down so that you can actually read. Um, you know, if there's anybody out there with dyslexia and that and you've gone through the mechanics of dealing with it and and learning workarounds you'll know exactly what i'm talking about um but there's uh you know i I remember as a kid um when you wanted a comic you had to go to uh you know a a convenience store or a gas station as they were called then um and or a a drugstore and find and find the spinner rack you know in the back of the store comics and a sign on the top of the rack Exactly, exactly. And man, there's the, the, the sound of that spinner rack, that, that rusty metal on metal, you know, creaking as you spun it around. You know, oh man, I remember saving up, uh, you know, my change, you know, and, and going to buy comics for 10 cents a piece, you know, what they were when I was a kid. Um, and, but now, you know, we, we live in an, in an age where, uh, I can literally, you know, uh, with the Comixology app on my phone, uh, if I'm sitting in a in a waiting room waiting on a doctor, I can download the newest issue of a comic and and read it on my phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's just a crazy. It's time an age of be. miracles. It is an age of miracles, and and I I think that uh, um, it's so easy to to lose sight of uh, just how what a wonderful time we live in. It's crazy, yep. but uh, anyway, so so 2015 was a good year. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, lots of good stuff in 2016. I've got uh, a couple of books that that I'm going to get out this year. Uh, lots of new stuff coming with the podcast. Um, yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, I have a lot of hope for 2016. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing some original creative projects like the, the project we were talking about before, and and I might curate another anthology. We'll just have to see. How that how that happens or doesn't happen, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's there's no there's nowhere to look but forward, right? That's right, that's right. Um, uh, you were talking about original work. Uh, 2015 was was an awesome year uh, for me. I know for a lot of people it was for collaboration. Uh, I think there were a lot of a lot of great anthologies came mm-hmm. out, a lot of joint projects. So there there was a seemed to be a lot of kind of team building that happened in 2015 that uh, uh, I'm really grateful for. Uh, I, I made a lot of great relationships in, in 2015, uh, saw a lot of uh, really innovative uh, projects come, go, some stayed, some didn't, but uh, a lot of things, uh, I think some some ground was broken, and uh, I'm really thankful for that. And um, I hope that uh, that spirit continues into 2016, But but like you, uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, kind of getting back to some of my own trailblazing, mm-hmm. and uh, really excited about yeah, that. Absolutely, it's going to be a great year. It is, Chris. Thanks for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to to chat with you and to uh, just run our mouths for a while. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I hope everyone has a uh, a great New Year and uh, stay safe out there this weekend. Happy holidays. Yeah.